we're, we're always open to hearing from you, um, hear from you about topics of interest and concern, and we can, we can pull some people in to, to talk a little bit on that topic. So um, if there's things you, you and your organization have been mulling about and stewing about, or you've heard about and want to know more, just let me know and we'll see if we can find some folks to come in um, and share. Uh, these programs are pretty informal, so I'm just going to ask everybody to stay on mute while our presenters are speaking, and then there will be chances to unmute yourself and to ask questions. If questions come up, um, you might just throw them in the chat, and I can kind of find an opportune moment to interrupt our presenters um, and, and get your question asked. Um, I also wanted to let you know that Everything shared here, the PowerPoint and some additional materials will be emailed to you um, maybe later today, but definitely by the end of the week. Um, so you don't need to take frantic notes. Um, it, you can um, definitely, um, you'll have access to this PowerPoint and um, to the recording so you can share that with, with colleagues um, on your end. Uh, what else was I going to say? I think that's pretty much it. Um, if you're not um, on our Heritage e-news, um, and not finding out about these programs, please send me an email. I'll drop my email in the in the chat. And so we can get you on our mailing list so that you can know about all the kind of upcoming things. We have some programs coming up on, um, we haven't announced them yet, but on accessibility in your museums and in your digital spaces, um, making sure that folks with disabilities can access all of your wonderful programming in your spaces. Um, some programs about ghost stories in museums and some some sort of interesting things that we're working on. So um, stay tuned. And with that, I am going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Brad, um, and so we can get started. Take it away, Brad. All right, how's everyone doing today? Nice, good to see you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, so today, you know, we're here in Oral History 101, uh, stay calm and hit record. Uh, and the first thing I, I like to open up with a little bit is what television show do you think most embodies museums? If you could put that in the chat real quick, I'd love to see what telev television show uh, you think most embodies museums. And at the end, I'm gonna give you my answer on uh, what television show I think museums most embody. But first, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Brad Richardson. I'm the executive director at the Clark County Historical Museum. Uh, next year will be my 13th year with the museum in total from uh, being a volunteer that used to scrub toilets all the way to executive director. Uh, I also have a couple other hats I'll throw on real quick. I'm also the vice president of the Washington Museum Association, uh, and I'm a trustee for Humanities Washington. I also serve on our local lodging tax committee and the Cultural Arts and Heritage Commission here in Vancouver. And the reason I mention those is that if you're working with any of those groups, lodging tax or your Arts, Heritage and Culture Commission in your local area, um, you can always reach out to me on behalf of the Washington Museum Association and I can work with you to kind of talk about strategy and help with uh, working with those types of commissions. I'm also familiar with historic preservation commissions. Um, I here as staff have been all the way from the visitor services coordinator to museum experience coordinator to curator to to now director. So I basically have seen the entire pipeline of the system of how you work in a museum and all the different levels and stages. And I've done quite a few oral histories uh, in my own life, both poorly and well. And so I have experiences of what not to do and what to do. Uh, and now I want to hand it off and let my fellow colleague and friend Steve Becker introduce himself. Well, thank you so much, Brad. I'm uh, I'm honored to be included in this. You know, I started out my my working life as a reporter at a radio station in Seattle, and uh, was so captivated by by the people I got to talk to. Uh, I remember interviewing a, a gentleman named George Anderson uh, one day in Seattle on Pearl Harbor Day, and he'd been on the battleship Oklahoma, and I will never forget his vivid descriptions of what it was like to be in a battleship that had just been torpedoed. I remember a, a Holocaust survivor in Spokane named Eva Lossman. Uh, you know, I was stunned uh, at the vividness of these stories. And I, some of those were captured on cassette tapes that sat in a box for years. And Brad kind of led me to a guy at WSU Vancouver named John Barber, who said, you know, Steve, it's not that hard to, to digitize that stuff and save it. And so I started going back over my collection of old cassettes from my days working in radio and people I'd interviewed, including my grandfather. Um, and I started putting them on a SoundCloud page uh, just to save them, to have some place to put them. Um, and Brad has been, you know, I think we're very fortunate in our community to have 
an executive director of our museum who just says, do it, Steve, go, go, go. Don't worry about the details. Go get those stories, get them recorded, and we'll figure out how to polish them up later. But the important thing is to get the content right now, as soon as you can. And so that's that's kind of the mandate that that I took this project on. The, the, I think the one we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Uh, in 1972, I was uh, 13 years old at McLaughlin Junior High School in Vancouver. And on April the 5th of 1972, I witnessed a, a tornado uh, scoot by our school. Um, and it was a shock. It was, it was an amazing experience. And what we had later learned was that a group of students at Fort Vancouver High School and there's the faculty literally dropped what they were doing and went running to a place called Peter S. Ogden Elementary School and pulled children out of the rubble. Um, in February of this year, it dawned on me that it seems like this is an anniversary. And I think I talked to Brad about it and Brad said, Steve, go do it. So my original intent was to gather material for an article that I would write for the Clark County uh, Historical Annual um, that will come out in a couple of days. But I had all these interviews and I thought, what am I gonna do with these? I mean, they were just priceless. I mean, they, again, they were these, these vivid detailed recollections of that day of that tornado, which was the only fatal tornado in the United States in 1972. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of proposed this and I, I, again, I created another SoundCloud page just cause it was, a, it was like a listening platform. It's free, uh, I could upload this stuff and then Brad and his team could listen to it and see if it, if it fit their criteria, if my interviews fit his criteria for an oral history. So I'm very grateful to have a guy in our community who, who, has, who has urged me and other people to make this uh, my museum and, and to share the stories that I could find. And so that's kind of, Brad, I'll leave it at that and, and hand it back to you. And I'm, I feel privileged to be here and to, and to share some of the, the projects that we've worked on this year, Brad. Thank you, Steve. And so the goals for this session, so I, I always like to say this whenever I, I do a session or anything of that nature is to say, we're going to throw a lot at you right now. We don't expect you to remember all of this. You're going to have the recording, but you also have us as resources. We can connect and talk about the more detailed pieces. But the thing that we've done here at, at CCHM is we've really spent probably about 15 years digitizing records and we have you know several decades of, of interviews and oral histories and so we've been able to work with these materials and understand um both how they're kind of malleable and what we can do with these and so today what we want to do is we want to walk through the obstacles that keep us from capturing stories in our communities um and then from there we want to discuss possible solutions to these obstacles that you can use uh, that we found from our own experience so all of this stuff is coming from our own experience uh, as the clark county historical museum and then we want to note some real world examples and some opportunities where you might be able to um you know kind of create the same systems that we've created here that aren't gonna you know outstrip your capacity and then additionally, as Steve was mentioning, we want to provide you a case study and talk about Steve's work capturing interviews for his article for the 1972 tornado in Vancouver. And Steve right away brings a great example of the fact that Steve had all this background. He was a journalist. Steve knows how to interview. You know, I know he's not going to go and say, hey, uh, you know, interview uh, subject. Let's go meet at the loudest Starbucks possible and sit down with my my iPhone uh, that has like a 5% battery. So I knew there was a trust there. And that's the thing is you're working with the community is you're understanding engaging case by case, the person that is wanting to go out and do that interview. And instead of what trying to hinder them from doing it in any manner, you have to think about, about it as you're providing them support. Steve, Steve needed some support, but little support. I could just let him out of the gate and that guy is going to run. Um, and so I knew that right away. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that case study and how that evolved in that specific situation. But before we get there, Let's start off with oral history versus interview. This is something we've been grappling with down here for, for a little while. Um, because what happens is, is whenever we talk about interviews in the museum field or history field or cultural sector, we always say, oh, we're gonna do an oral history. And an oral history is a very specific 
task. As you can see, you need a scope of interview for your or, or project for your interview. You, you usually develop a relationship with your subject, um, which is phone calls ahead of time. You're connecting with them. There's a lot of legwork that's happening before you're doing that oral history. You do a pre-interview questionnaire. So you're getting the baseline because a big thing about the oral history is you want to get the content of that person's life or the content of what you want to examine in that story right up front. Because once you have that content, you're going to then go examine at the their background through research. You're going to do, you know, all the things you're going to do. So, you know, like, like Mike, uh, with the, the Cowlitz Nation history, I'm going to go through the Columbian newspaper and I'm going to research all of the things that you did as an elder. And I'm going to understand that before I come and sit down and have a conversation with you. Cause I don't want to be asking, well, well, Hey Mike, like, what have you done? Then he's just going to list off all of these accomplishments, but I'm not really fulfilling the intent of the oral history because an oral history is not about content. It's about context. You want to understand why people did things, who were around them when they did them, what was that inertia, and then you'll actually provide your subject in an oral history with uh, topics for discussion. You're going to say, hey, we're going to talk about, you know, federal recognition, we're going to talk about, you know, um, all of these different things that are happening, and then you're going to develop an interview guide for that subject or that project that's specific, uh, so it's more going to be catered very particularly to that individual, and then you're going to conduct an interview that uh, gathers contextual information about that subject's experience. So like if I was talking to Susie, I'd say, hey, you know, how did, you know, how did you get involved with the Le Center Museum? And then I would know like Susie did an exhibit maybe on stern wheelers uh, that used to go up, uh, you know, the river and say, you know, what, why did you pick that topic and who worked with you and where did you gather the information to do that? So I'm getting contextual information. And then there's going to be a transcript. You're going to have an auditor. So you're going to transcribe it, and then someone's going to review your transcript to make sure it's correct. And then you, the biggest thing that's so important in interviews and oral histories is that your subject gets to review that content. It's really, really important because not just for accuracy, but for trust. Because in the history and museum field, the number one commodity that we really trade in is trust with our community. So we're not trying to, you know, uncover something that the subject doesn't necessarily want to talk about. We want to make sure there's a trust and relationship that's ongoing with our subjects when we do interviews. And then there's an archive process. So that's that's oral history. And as you can see, that's a really intensive process that requires research. It requires additional skills beyond just putting a recorder down and being able to sit and talk with someone. Now. The interview on the other end of the spectrum, you do want to have a scope of that interview. You want to know what you're going in to ask, you know, whether it's a life history, whether it's a professional history, um, or if you have a specific project, like say Steve with his project, he's interviewing 1972 tornado uh, you know, people who were involved with that. And then you're going to have a limited relationship with your subject, potentially. It might be that you maybe met them once or twice, or you may have just meet them for the first time when you're doing that interview. And that's okay because it's all about trying to create the space to capture stories. And then you may have uh, limited to no background research on that individual. Um, so that's something you make sure you're communicating as you're walking into that, being like, hey, I'm not really familiar with uh, you know, what you're doing, so I just want to find out more about you. And then with the interview, you'll have a predetermined set of general questions. And you know, we'll talk a little bit more about Archivist in a Backpack, because this is a pro project that we have that's really using that model of predetermined set questions that are pretty much the same every time. So as opposed to the interview guide that's really catered towards the specific individual, this is very broad um, set of questions. And then what that is, what you're going to get through an interview is really a baseline story captured, and you're gathering content and context at the same time. So it's not going to be as rich as an oral history. You're not going to get to the why necessarily within an interview of, of why someone did something, but you can kind of gather that content and then from there ask and follow up on the context. But remember, you, you get about an hour to an hour and a half with someone. You don't really want to be stretching into two, three, four hours. And so that's why there's the difference in these tools. But the thing that we're really developing down here, the model and ethic that we're we're using at the museum is it's not one or the other, but instead it's a spectrum. You, you can do something that trends more towards oral history, and you could do something that trends more towards a straight up just sit down interview, or you can have something that falls somewhere in between. You know, maybe you're going to do an interview, but you have 10 minutes to be able to do a little bit of research and cater some questions. 
that's okay because the thing is I found with us, we kept saying, we need to capture the stories of people in our community. There was an individual by the name of Bill Hidden that I'm sure many people know here in Vancouver um, that was the Hidden family's historian and the Hiddens you know, had the brickyard here in Vancouver and basically built Vancouver. And we kept saying, we need to do an oral history with Bill. We need to do an oral history with Bill. We tried to get an oral historian that was paid to do it, but we couldn't afford to get that to do it. We tried to have staff do it, but the staff doesn't have the time to do it. And we kept saying, you have to be this tall to ride the ride to interview Bill and then he passed away and we don't have his interview. Instead, I had 20 times that I went to his house for, house for coffee. I could have just put my phone down at the table and said, Bill, tell me about your life and at least captured something. So I think we have to start thinking about the difference between oral history and interview. Also in this difference, an oral history is something that is very valuable. It takes expertise and skills. And I think as a field, we should value that. We should invest in folks that take their time and effort to do that process. Um, it's really important to value the skills that someone has worked hard to develop. And with the interview, we can all kind of be a little more able to do that and have access even at varying levels of skill. And if you want a really detailed step-by-step -step guide on uh, um, how to do an oral history, the Smithsonian has a really nice one. And I put the link at the bottom of this page. And I'm just going to pause for a second because I want Steve to kind of jump in and see if he has anything to add about the oral history versus interview topic that we just covered real quick. Well, and I think that's why our collaboration has been really important to me, Brad, because I, you know, I have to tell you, I look at this, you know, the oral history versus interview and I start to feel stress. I start to feel, you know, there's, oh, there's this structure, there's all these rules, there's all these guidelines that I have to follow. And, you know, I'm an old deadline reporter. I, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I learned how to do this. Uh, with people breathing down my neck and I learned how to engage people and look them in the eye and ask questions and then shut up and try to let them talk. <laughs> so I think that's where our collaboration has been really helpful. Um, I'm not a historian, I'm an interviewer and I feel really comfortable engaging with people and asking them to tell me about themselves and their lives. I feel really comfortable redirecting them when they kind of wander off the topic. I feel really comfortable with follow-up questions when they kind of glazed across the surface of a topic. Um, but I want my story say, I want these, because I believe so much in the stories that, that I've helped record, the interviews are recorded, but I know I'm not a historian and I need a, I need a historian who can give it that context that in my case, that, that Brad and his team at the at our museum bring. So I appreciate being told I was tall enough for the ride, uh, <laughs> that I can do this. Um, but knowing that there were people keeping an eye on me the whole time. So I, I think that's where, what, what I've heard you say and what's been important to me is just this collaboration, is that you're, you're willing to let me go out and do it. And, and then you provide the, the, the context that turns it into some kind of an oral history. Yeah, absolutely. So from there, we really have to look at another little bit of soul searching for ourselves as museums is what is your role as a museum or a history or heritage organization? And again, like Steve just mentioned, the obstacle can tend to always be the, the team volunteers or staff at a museum are like, well, we need to do this. Well, well, or we need to train you or we need to show you how to do this specific item. And also we are often in the field deciding the projects and the scope of what is happening. And I always have my joke of talking about, you know, coming down the mountain with two tablets of history. Uh, we, we have to start kind of moving away from that sense and really taking the lead from our community. And so the solution to this is moving towards a facilitation model that provides community agency. So what we need to try and do in our museum is move away from being the content experts to being the facilitators that teach the tools and have you know expertise in the use of these tools that can then help the community decide on its own how to do it and then what we do is we open doors and we get out of the way and i think that's a really important piece of this process and that's a really important piece for our future as organizations because if we kind of continue to say, oh, well, we need to do it or we need to know everything. 
well, there's only so many of us that are going to work in that institution. But if you empower a broader community, like yesterday, I was sitting down with uh, Our Lady of Lords School, and you know, they said, hey, we have a bunch of students that want to do service projects. Can they come pick up trash around the museum, or can they can they cut the grass or pull the weeds? And I said, y you know what they could do? They could be active in helping save your story. We have a program called Archivists in a Backpack. Could we get the students to check out the backpacks, sit down, and interview um, those who have had long connection with your congregation in school. And it just kind of, it blew their minds. And I said, you know, we're never going to be able to do that on our own. And so we would love to have you participate and we just want to facilitate and we want to provide you agency to capture that story for your own community. And so that's really important. And so in practice, you want to build community center facilitation processes. You want to provide community partners and volunteers with agency over the process. And can, you can create community driven archive uh, process also. Um, and so one example, obviously, is Steve with the 72 tornadoes. Another example of us doing that is with the Growing Up in Vancouver page here in Vancouver, Washington. They had a picnic uh, over the summer and they said, hey, we want to capture oral histories during the picnic because we're gonna have a lot of people with a lot of history there and what we did is we took our archivist in a backpack um, kit that we have which has recorders and questions and all the things that we needed to conduct an interview and we said we'll conduct an interview um, and we'll bring some volunteers to do that and so we essentially had two volunteers sitting at two tables and we had a rotating cast of people from the picnic sitting down for 30 minute sessions to talk about their life stories and we had people from the group from growing up in Vancouver say, oh, you need to talk to Mark. He played in the NFL for the Raiders. And he was like the, the high school, you know, football star at Fort. You need, to, you need to talk with Mark or you need to talk with Florence because, you know, she, she's lived here for her entire life. And she knows all the stories of what downtown used to look like and all of these different things. And so we were letting the group inform who we interviewed and that scope. So we went over to the interview and said, hey, we have Mark here. He used to play football for the NFL. Like, let's talk about his life story and his career. And that's really creating a facilitating process where they're doing that. And then in addition, we've developed relationships with the university, um, Washington State University and their public history programs. And so we've also had students do interviews for projects like our labor exhibit and then public history classes have done a number of interviews. And then community driven archives, that's a very specific thing. And that is where communities that have not um, felt welcome within the museum or welcome within the history field are having the opportunity to have full agency and ownership of telling their own story on their own terms. And we worked with the Vancouver NAACP and Fourth Plane Forward to create this archivist in a backpack, which is going to get rebranded. Uh, we're, we've, we want to make it a little more locally named. So we're going to find a fun name. So also throw your fun names for it in the chat if you want to help us. Hey, hey Brad, yeah. in the yeah. materials that you share with us later, would you mind sharing the contents of your archivists in a bag just so we can kind of see what you include in that? 100%. We'll get that for you at the end. Um, and so this one here, especially with Fourth Plain, Fourth Plain Forward is the economic uh, development group for our international district here. We're actually going to provide them these backpacks with these oral history kits um, at their office and people from the community will be able to come and check them out. So people from the community are gonna interview people of the community. And so they're gonna speak a common language. They're gonna understand a common culture and those interviews are gonna be so much more rich. And then they get to decide what access and agency we get to have with those. So we wouldn't use those without going back to the stakeholder and saying, how do you want to talk about this? How do you want to use this? And so that community driven archive is really taking that archive and placing it in the hand of that community that has not historically felt welcome to have their story shared or captured um, for the broader community. And it's, it's a long and it's, it's a difficult process, but it's so important for us to move in that direction. And so Steve, I'm gonna give you a second if you've got anything to jump in on this part. I think you've covered it really well. I, I do, I, I agree with you completely. And I, uh, I am, you know, I've, I've lately, I've been kind of following my own, some of my own experiences and my, my own ancestors, but I really am interested in underserved communities, uh, whether it's African-American or tribal or women or, uh, you know, people who haven't always had the, the historic pen in their hand. And I think that, uh, his, the, the interviews that we get to conduct, uh, should they be included in an oral history, 
are really an opportunity to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. And I just, I really, really like that idea a lot. Um, a couple of years ago, I was helping my, my dad uh, and his wife move into assisted living. And I found a journal that my grandmother had kept during the Second World War. Um, and I had no idea that my great grandmother was a chicken farmer. And that uh, while her son was off uh, in, in war uh, in the South Pacific during the Second World War, uh, she was making money running a business as a farmer. Uh, and I had always remembered my grandfather's perspective of that relationship. So anyway, I, I ended up writing a story for Brad in the, in the annual, the museum annual about my great grandmother as, a, as an entrepreneur, which is really what she was. But I, I think that these stories really are a way of bringing so much more depth and breadth to our historic record and so much more detail. And I think it's a great opportunity for that. Thanks, Steve. So now do some logistics, recording equipment. I'm sure everyone thinks about, you know, we're going to do an oral history. Well, what, what do I use? You know, how do I capture this? Um, it can be really intimidating, especially with the rise of so much technology. So, you know, we're not sure what to use. For us, traditionally, uh, Zoom recorders have been the thing that we'll use. And I'll show you an example of that. And that's what we actually have in our archivist in a backpack kits uh, with a micro SD card. And then Steve and Steve and I were actually talking yesterday. Headphones aren't a bad thing to get. And what's funny is in the oral history sessions that I've taken and the classes that I've I've engaged in, um, we never did talk about having a, you know a set of cans on the old ears. Uh, and so Steve and I come from audio backgrounds, me from playing terrible rock music and Steve from being on the radio. Uh, and so we understand that headphones are really important. And so that is also good because if you're uncertain or nervous at all that you're not capturing that story, having a set of headphones um, can help at least at the beginning to let you know for sure that that's coming through. And if, and I, then, yeah, if, I, could, if, if I could add, Brad, yeah. just really quickly, I, years ago when I worked in, in the news business, I was at a seminar put on by uh, that Howard Burkus from NPR was one, of the, was one of the presenters. And he said, you know, the advantage to wearing headphones is that you're hearing what's being recorded. Not, yeah. not what you think is being recorded, but you are hearing exactly what your recording device is hearing. And that can help you to, to move the position of the microphone. It can help you say, wait a minute, this location's too noisy. I don't like this. There's so many ambient sounds in our day-to-day -day life, you know, the ticking of a fan or the, the yep. whir of a, of a heater that we block out um, that would be a distraction, I think, in any archived uh, historic interview. And by wearing headphones, you're going to pick up on that right away. Pardon the interruption, Brad. No, no, not at all. And actually, uh, for those who don't know, computer towers make sound. Uh, so you always want to be aware if you're doing an interview near a computer tower, there is a potential you're going to get kind of a, a high pitch sound or a hum or a buzz or some kind of sound of air or something like that. And we just filter a lot of those things out. So Steve's 100% right in that. But the other thing to remember, too, is that we all have recorders in our pockets. We also have tablets. We also have computers. So if it is something where it's, you know, cost prohibitive to try to buy a recorder, you can utilize because just, I mean, you know, there's been motion picture films uh, captured on these things uh, recently. So, you know, the quality of what comes through on a phone, as long as you position it correctly, and, you know, obviously with the phone position as close to your subject as possible, because um, their part of the conversation is much more important. But, you know, tablets, cell phones, um, you know, just make sure that you put it in airplane mode so you don't get a call right in the middle of the uh, of the interview. Um, and, you know, these recorders are cheaper than ever. Uh, here is a Zoom recorder and a micro SD. So in total to purchase all of this uh, would be, I think, about probably about $170 total uh, between the recorder and the micro SD. And I, I have uh, links that I'm gonna send in my notes that will give you the exact numbers for these specific items here. But this is it, the, you know, and your optional headphones. This is what you need to be able to capture an oral history interview. And the big thing I wanna point out is make sure you look at that gigabyte because some of these recorders have gigabyte restrictions. So like this one in particular will only accept a 32 gigabyte uh, SD card. So we bought 128 gigabytes thinking we were gonna be super cool and capture a bunch of history. Well, it errored out our recorder the day we went to go use it. Uh, so we had to rush to go grab a 32 one. So, uh, you know, there's always mistakes to be made and lessons to be learned. Uh, so editing equipment. 
So we have our recording, we've recorded it. What do we do with it now? Well, you can transfer these easily with your USB cable to your laptop. And a good editing piece of editing equipment is Audacity, which is free and it's very easy to use. You click it, you put it in, you select the um, input that you want and it will really pretty much just download it. And the big thing is you wanna download it into a WAV format if possible. And if you have it in MP3 original, you wanna to try to convert it to WAV. Um, which shouldn't be with an E, it should be just WAV. Um, and uh, the reason for that is WAV is a stable format and that's what's used for audio archiving. So there's edi editing equipment that's very uh, easy to get to and free to use. So you can review your interview and make sure that it sounds all good. Now, recording equipment funding, obstacles obviously are funding for recording equipment. Funding can be intimidating. Um, so funding for equipment, you can do it through grants. And everyone also has a digital device that they have recording capabilities with, again, too. And recorder equipments are, again, cheaper than ever, but you have Humanities Washington Spark Grants. So if you're going to do a small set of oral histories, you can include in the Spark Grant, uh, they ask for the digital recorder. Uh, you have Washington Digital Heritage Grants, which are a little bit bigger. And then you also have your local Historic Preservation Commission. So HPG Grant is what's here in Clark County. But any historic grants from your Historic Preservation Commission. There is money out there for all of us based on the Historic Preservation Commissions and counties. There is money that's set aside specifically for historic preservation. And if you have no money, use a cell phone, computer, or tablet. So the next thing is la lacking the professional expertise for processing. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't feel like we can uh, have the expertise to completely process or archive audio. And that's where we can develop uh, partnerships with archives programs. Um, in practice, you can connect with your local or regional library, uh, a community college, a university, and discuss how possible partnerships and opportunities for students to gain experience. Uh, Emporia, I think, is a big one here in Washington State um, that has a program that does archives. But we've partnered with the WCU Archive and Library. Uh, the, the UW Museology program is a program you could reach out to, uh, WCU's Public History program, and then there's the Western Washington Fairhaven College of Interdisciplinary Studies uh, that all are focused on uh, audio and digital technologies, and these are ways that you can reach out to maybe these bigger state institutions and see if there's an ability to connect and create a partnership. So then the labor pool, obviously we need people to be able to do these oral histories and we can't do them all ourselves. So we have limited staff and time to conduct a full oral history transcript. So we need to establish partnerships to help widen your labor pool. So you can work with local organizations, libraries, colleges, universities, and others. Uh, and so, for example, we've worked with WCU's public history program and they've done uh, numerous interviews for us. We're actually working with Portland State University. So don't let the don't let the border intimidate you. Uh, if you're on the east side of the state and maybe you have some Eastern Oregon universities or Central Oregon universities, um, take a trip over and see if they have a public history program or an archives program or a library program and connect and see if they have any interest in students being able to come and help conduct oral histories. Um, again, our archivist in a backpack program with Vancouver NAACP and Fourth Plane Forward, which really creates a lot of agency uh, for people to be able to do that. And then just continuing to develop uh, partnerships with local interest groups. So like here we have our Growing Up in Vancouver Facebook page. We have a Growing Up in Camas Facebook page. All of those pages are full of people who are interested in opportunities to maybe capture stories. So put a line out and see if someone wants to take a recorder and go out and do some interviews. And you know, just continue to try to give communities the agency and empower them to, uh, to do that. And I'm gonna pause for a second. I kind of zoomed through a couple things. Steve, do you have uh, any comments on any of that? No, uh, you know, the, I just think about the phone and the, 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 you're right. These are such uh, incredible, tools. Uh, my dad, on a very personal note, has significant dementia. Um, and my brother and I were visiting him not long ago. And I have a recording on this phone. Uh, my dad was a choir director, and he still remembers a lot of hymns. And I have a recording of my brother and I singing hymns with my dad that he immediately can recall. So there are really personal uh, ways that you can pull these things out and just record a voice memo. And it's a, it's a priceless recording. It has 
absolutely no historical implication outside of my family, uh, but it is something that I enjoy sharing with my kids. So you're right, there's a lot of technology available right now. Yep, yeah. thanks, Steve. So the other piece too is now, you know, we have our recordings, we've had people go out and do all these interviews, accessioning uh, these interviews. This can be intimidating because, uh, you know, staff and expertise on accessioning, specifically in auto, uh, audio recording, when you accession materials, it's always going to be different based on the medium that's coming in on its format and all of that. And so if you're, so here's kind of a, a you know, you want to work with other orgs that already have established process. I cannot, uh, emphasize this enough. If you don't have a process, if you don't have familiarity, if you don't have comfort, why invent any wheel when you can go to someone else and get assistance, whether it's all the way up to the state level, reaching out to the state historical society, or it's connecting with your local county museum, regional museum, municipal museum. And the big thing, and I have two pieces and two groups I'm going to speak to right now. First, I'm going to speak to the big guys big guys with paid staff, people who have capacity, people who have funding, uh, us right here. We do have an onus to work with our small volunteer, municipal, locally centered, topical uh, heritage groups, museums and institutions to uh, impart and share as much of our process as accessibly as we can. So. I know we all have the same capacity issues. We all have the same the same stresses that are on top of us. I know that we're all overworked and trying to continually just make the grade, but understand we have a privilege and honor of doing this full time for, for our lives. And so we have to take some ownership to work with the other museums that maybe are all volunteer ran or don't have those expertise to at least um, package the process or provide the materials as readily and easily as we possibly can. Um, and so that's that's the first piece. And then the the groups that are grassroots, that are volunteer led, that are, you know, doing it through your 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 spare time, which I'm sure we all have plenty of, right? Uh, you know, look to the bigger uh, institutions that do have people that do this day in and day out because those institutions have people who have dedicated both their time, uh, talent, and treasure to become experts in these things. They've invested their lives and they're stewarding um, broader things for the community. So go to those organizations, support them, and then try to work with the bigger institutions to have a more um, consistent model in your region or area on how you do these processes. Because what will happen is we will all become better as we have conversations and we help um, the larger institutions help smaller organizations uh, do these process we also review our own process and become more effective and and better at what we do and so it's a really great relationship to have and so i can't advocate enough for big institutions share your accession process share your protocols share your methods share your documents with the smaller institutions and smaller institutions be really engaged with your larger regional kind of flagship organizations that are in the area both regional and statewide uh, archiving equipment. Okay, so we have all this stuff, right? We have this process. We've accessioned these things. Where do we put these things? Where do they go? Uh, so again, funding for equipment can be intimidating. Um, so portable hard drives is an affordable way to start. And they're, again, more affordable than ever. Uh, funding for equipment can come through grants. And you can also collaborate with local archives, uh, both locally, regionally, to be able to uh, do these things. And one of our things that we have is our online hosting for our digital collections for our oral history collection that's already online. It is hosted through Washington State University, Vancouver. Um, so we don't have to pay for content DM, which is the big expensive program that we could not afford. Um, and so we've partnered with WSU to make that happen. And what's happened is we've taken that model and we've tried to start replicating that with other institutions. So Two Rivers Heritage Museum now has photos hosted through that. The Vancouver Barracks Military Association now has photos hosted through that in partnership with WSU. And then just recently, we, uh, we're about to receive confirmation uh, that we've received a collaborative grant that's gonna include the North Clark Historical Museum, the LaCenter Historical Museum, Clark County, uh, two rivers and the Vancouver barracks to all archive and process audio and prepare it with metadata and all of that information that's necessary to then be 
put on Content DM in a collaborative archive that's going to be called the Clark County Sound and Vision Archive. So through those pieces, we've been able to, you know, get all of this information out to the public and be able to archive it. And we started here archiving our oral, oral histories from audio tapes. We got a USB uh, tape transfer machine. We transferred them to hard drives uh, that we nervously had locked away in multiple versions. So you need to have multiple <laughs> versions of your portable hard drive. Don't just have one. And now we actually have a Synology server, which is like 40 terabytes that we store our digital archive on that's now cloud connected and it's super robust. And we're about two years away from uh, filling up all 40 terabytes and we're gonna have to buy a second Synology and eventually we're gonna need to move to cloud storage. So understand that it's a progression of those small drives to maybe a server to eventually cloud storage for these archives as they grow because you're gonna start creating terabytes and terabytes of information and data as you collect these things. Sharing with the world, I just mentioned that we talked about funding for databases and expertise for online management can be really, really onerous. So partnerships with institutions or already established online archives, creation of consortiums for digital archives. So university partnerships and beyond. So we partnered again with WCU Vancouver uh, for a long time. We're now partnering collaboratively with our other museums. And it might get to a point where maybe all the museums in Clark County see the value in this and we say, well, maybe we need our own content DM process or system. Uh, so there's possibilities of being able to invest collectively in something. And then we've just recently been able to also incorporate our archive into the digital Northwest Digital Heritage Archive, which is uh, ran by both the Washington State Library and Oregon State Library. And so now our digital reach is massive because we partnered with larger institutions that have capacity to hold uh, our archives online for us. And I so- I interrupt you really quick, Brad. Yeah, absolutely. So some of you may not have heard of Content DM before. Um, and if you've talked to Evan Robb at Northwest Digital Heritage, um, it's probably come up. We are gonna, um, not to sidetrack us, but, um, we are gonna we're gonna try and set up a program for Evan to come and talk a little bit more about Northwest Digital Heritage. Um, there are some very specific criteria that collections need to meet to be included in this massive, amazing, super accessible, super archive, basically. Um, and we are trying to figure out ways that it, it being included in that program can be more accessible to our smaller organizations and figure all of that out. So. I just shared the link. If you haven't checked out their website, it's amazing. And we can't wait to, to get more involved, but stay tuned for more information. And, and I can jump in actually, Allison, to talk about a little bit about the model we've created down here to create that accessibility is that we, as a, as again, as a paid institution with paid staff that has that professional background, we uh, did the R&D <laughs> on digital collections and metadata and all the things that need to happen for content DM. And what we've done is created a process where students from our university actually help create that data through grants. And then we took that model and we've handed it off to the, the more local volunteer led institutions like Two Rivers is the big one, uh, the Camas Washougal Historical Society. We've really just said, here's the model, here's the process. We made the relationships and the connections. So again, bigger institutions that have capacity and knowledge, you need to formalize your model, then reach out to your local organizations that maybe are volunteer led that don't have the expertise and package that and help create the process for them to be able to do that. And again, I know that's extra work, but the benefit that comes from that is so worth any of that effort because you don't just open up more access to um, the archives, which is a huge piece, you also create really meaningful and deep and trust, trusting relationships with your other museums. And everybody sees the fact that we all need to collaborate and work together. And you extending that uh, right off the bat is really, really helpful. So I just can't advocate. And if anyone wants to talk off session later more about that process that we developed and kind of how to model that, I can definitely walk you through like that specific piece. And if anybody wants an introduction to their local, their closest, larger museum with professional staff, let me know and I can 
do a little e intro. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. So now we've talked about a lot of nuts and bolts. I've thrown a lot of things at you again. I don't expect you to remember all of these things, but it's just to get you an idea of some of the process and some of the ways that you can do this. But now let's let Steve talk about his interviews and the process that he went through to capture those, uh, both things that worked well and things that were struggles. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Brad. And you know, the, uh, this really started out as uh, in, in back in January, I realized that this was the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Vancouver tornado. And that was a big event in my life. But I was also, <laughs> pardon me, my initial thought was I was just going to write an article for the Clark County Historical Museum for the annual. That was my intent, was to just do that. And if they said no, if they didn't want it for some reason, um, it was okay. I mean, I still was gonna, going to, to write the story down. Um, I, I have to say, one of the things that was in the back of my mind was that I'm not a trained historian. I'm, I'm just an old deadline reporter. And I like storytelling and I like sharing people's stories. I had, and I think what was really foremost in my mind, I had a recent experience with a state historical society in another state. Uh, and I had submitted an article to their publication about a, a woman who was a Hall of Fame athlete in that state, who I had never heard of, who actually turned out to be a relative of mine. And I submitted this article to this other state. And they said, hey, this is a really nice story, but it's not academic. We're not interested. It's just, no, we want a, we want a peer reviewed academic story. So. Okay, and I think that's initially what I was, Brad and I have talked about uh, collecting interviews for an oral history for a long time. And this is the first time I actually kind of felt like I, I took the risk. Um, and I wasn't certain if I, could I fit his definition or the museum's definition of what an oral history interview entailed? Uh, was it similar to the kinds of interviews that I had done earlier in my professional life? So. So it started out with just a, a question in my mind, what about the 72 tornado? Are there still people around who remember it? I remembered it, uh, who was available? Uh, so the first thing I did was I went to the, the Vancouver uh, library and I started doing some research. I, I looked for old articles about that day, um, about the tornado. And Brad had showed me how to use the microfilm system at the library on a different, a different story that I had been working on. Uh, I also called Fort Vancouver High School and said, is anybody there um, planning a, a, a member of any kind of an event around the 50th anniversary of the tornado? And the, the person I called said, um, I don't know of anything, but she said, let me connect you with the, there's an alumni association at Fort Vancouver High School and it's called Trappers for Trappers. And these are the alumnus and they get together and they look out after the current students. So they sent out a message uh, to a Facebook group um, and I was contacted by a gentleman named Vern Vestal and who's part of that group. And he had put out a message and he had uh, four or five people responded that they would be willing to talk to me about the tornado and about that day and their memories of that day. So we are met, arranged to meet right here. I said, I'll meet you at the front door to Fort Vancouver High School where this brass plaque um, uh, greets everyone who enters the building. And this plaque reminds everyone of what the students at Fort Vancouver High School did that day. Uh, they literally dropped what they were doing and they ran uh, just a short distance away to Peter S. Ogden Elementary School that had been demolished. It had been leveled uh, by the tornado. So they gave me some information. Um, interestingly enough, and Brad, I don't think I told you this, but um, the, the library, or the uh, Clark County Historical Museum has a great relationship with the local newspaper, the Columbian. And I had contacted the Columbian asking to use on behalf of the museum, their archival photos of that day. And I don't know if I triggered their interest or if somebody else figured it out, but they later told me that they knew somebody was poking around on the, on the 50th anniversary of their tornado. And so one of their retired reporters got involved who had been around. And he and I started communicating and we actually started sharing information. I said, I will give you everything I have because I think this is an important story. And he said, well, you know what? I'll give you everything I have. And he gave me the name of uh, Rick Grazer uh, who was in the building, uh, who when the building was uh, demolished and we'll hear, there's a sound clip from him the earlier in just a little bit. Um, 
you could go ahead, Brian, go ahead and advance to that next slide. That's fine. Um, so these are the people, the gentleman up on the far right there um, is Vern Vestal. And Vern was the one who connected me with these other folks. These are all people who were 14, 15, 16 uh, on the day of the tornado, uh, April the 5th, 1972. And they were students at the brand new Fort Vancouver High School. And um, they, uh, in some cases, uh, on the far left, Sherry um, saw the tornado as it, as it landed. Um, Jeannie Wright in the middle uh, in the dark coat who, whose eyes are closed uh, was in the building and she thought she would run to the library to see what she could do to help or she went to the office rather and she had was used to volunteering in the office and she told me how uh, she saw a little girl sobbing and her blood her dress was soaked in blood and she was sobbing not because she was hurt but because her dress was brand new and it had just been ruined by the blood stains. So these people all gave me very, very vivid memories of, of that day. Um, but I kept looking. Um, I, I wanted some more factual information about the history of this, of this day. And I actually found the, the, the United States Weather Service um, has an official report on the, the 1972 Vancouver tornado uh, with all kinds of, of great details about where the tornado started. And I knew that that information would be relevant to the article that I was writing for the museum, um, but it wasn't going to be posted on, on, a, on a website anywhere. But it really kept me going. And these people were, were so uh, helpful and joyful and, and I think delighted that somebody remembered. I think one of the ideas that I was testing in the process of writing this story was, was it as I remembered, did those people really run across the fields and go rescue the kids? And the fact of the matter is they did. Uh, that's exactly what many of them did. Uh, a lot of them said some of us were just in the building um, uh, and, and we helped out kids. There were high school students who went to the cafeteria and stole a tray of cookies and took it to these young children from, from Peter S. Ogden Elementary School. Uh, there were kids who went over to the demolished. This is Peter S. Ogden Elementary School a short time after the tornado hit it in 1972. Uh, there were there were kids uh, and thank you Columbia newspaper for sharing this archival uh, photo of that day. Um, uh, there were kids who went to this demolished building and pulled coats out of the rub out of the rubble. Um, there were there were kids at Fort Vancouver High School who helped get people organized who who wrote down names of kids who were dispatched to hospitals so the parents would know uh, where the where the children went. Uh, there were incredible details um, that that came out of this. Um, and I think one of the very best is the memories of Rick Grazier. And this is an audio clip the, of Rick. And Rick's going to describe what it was like to be inside this building when it was hit by a tornado. Uh, I've seen beams. I saw bricks. Uh, I ran to where my desk was, I threw the chair out. I was going to get under my desk. And as I was getting under my desk, I hear a cracking noise, you know, just like something's cracking. And I got up and I, you know, I looked up and I thought, no, this isn't a good spot. No, this, I got to get out of here. So I took off and ran about five steps, turned around and looked back. I was getting ready to get under a big, heavy teacher's desk in this main room. And I looked back and I watched a beam come in through, through the center of the school roof of the sixth grade building and it sucked those desks that I was under and all the papers that were hanging on the walls and anything that wasn't fastened down it sucked it out through that hole. Now what I did not know back in 1972 um, Rick was one of the survivors and that so Rick survived the collapse of his elementary the demolition of his elementary school and I'm going to get choked up here. <laughs> And he thought, what about my mom? His mom worked a short distance away at a bowling alley. And she was the manager of the, of the child care facility in the bowling alley. And he said, what about my mom? And he ran from Peter S. Ogden, the demolished elementary school, to the bowling alley, which had been flattened. It was a short distance away, but he said there was nobody there. So he just assumed everybody was out of the building. Um, so he, he ran home and uh, there was a lot of commotion. And finally somebody uh, alerted came to the house 
and said, Rick, your mom's dead. And Brad, is that clip available here? So this is Rick describing what his mother did uh, moments after the tornado hit. One second. Oh, come on. <laughs> of course. Well, yeah, Nash, it's it's fine. It's uh, Brad's got I I. So one of the questions about these, I had these really compelling uh, this audio that hey, I wasn't sure if this met you know standards for for being saved. I, I wasn't entirely clear about was this uh, suitable for. Uh, for, uh, you know, a real live historic archive. Anyway, here's the, here's a, here's a sound bite of Rick describing what his mother did that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, she got every child out. She had made, I heard 12 trips, 12 to 15 trips with a gentleman named Earl. And I know this because I got to talk to Earl. He told me exactly what happened. He said, Rick, we had got almost all the kids out. I think he said, we have one little girl left and she was under that void area. And he says, I didn't want her to go under there. And she says, I got to get her. And she turned around and went, hunched down and got under and went back in there and grabbed this little girl. And I guess she was all right. She was banged up, you know, but she was all alive. And she handed him to Earl. Earl had reached down to grab her, grab the little girl from her and the wall just came right down on top of her city and she was looking out towards him it came down on her back so sharon grazier was one of six people who died that day um, mm -hmm. none of the children in her care uh perished and she put the safety of those kids above her own um and i didn't know that story until i talked to rick and the only reason i got a, i was able to talk to rick was because i shared all the information i had with the reporter from the Columbia newspaper. Uh, he, had, he had not seen the US Weather Service official report on the tornado. And he said, well, I'll, I'll give you what I have. And so I was able to talk to Rick and um, it's very moving. Rick played for the Seattle Mariners for two years. Um, he is, has been in recovery for 14 years. He's very, very proud of that. Um, you know, what, what, we, what we, we had forgotten the human toll that, you know, the loss of one person um, and Rick's uh, has been appreciative just because he wants his mom's memory. He wants her to be remembered. Um, at the time, uh, Evans, uh, for those of you who may not have been in this part of the world at that time, Evans was Governor Dan Evans. Um, and uh, Rick Grazier told a story about how a helicopter landed in an empty field across there from their house one day. And there was this knocking sound at the door and it was Governor Dan Evans. Uh, who came to their door to express his his sadness at at their loss? Um, so there there were so I feel so honored to talk to these people. Um, so I guess it is personal to me a lot of these gathering these interviews, and I am so delighted that somebody like like Brad Richardson and the you know my Clark County Historical Museum has an interest in this stuff and is willing to to put it. And it looks like we've got another audio clip here, and I. I suspect this is of yes, Ann Varkados. And Ann was another one. She went on to, to be principal at the Peter S. Ogden School when it was rebuilt. And some of the students in her in her school were the, the children of people who'd been at Fort Vancouver High School that day. So here's an audio clip of another person who experienced the tornado. Jan went into the cafeteria and helped herself to the cookies for the kids from Peter S. Ogden because she just, that's all she, you know, we kind of all did what we could do to make it better for the kids. And then um, John Eagle, who was the track coach, he came up to me and he said, Ann, start writing down the names of the kids we're transporting by ambulance. And so I did that, ended up staying late, which then flipped my parents out because, you know, we didn't have cell phones or anything. That, you know, those kinds of details, you know, we forget that there were no cell phones in those days, that all the phone lines were down, there was no communication, the power was out in that in that neighborhood. Uh, at Mac High, the power was out, the school went dark. Um, I talked to people who were in the choir room at McLaughlin Junior High School, and they said it just went pitch black all of a sudden. And uh, they didn't know what it sounded like, they said it sounded like a freight train was going over their heads, uh, and the air was sucked out of the room, and they thought it was the end of the world. Uh, there were kids sobbing uh, who were very, very traumatized. 
though they survived. And I think that those are some of the details. Just a couple of quick things. Um, from a procedural standpoint, I didn't know if I had recorded these interviews in a way that they could be used in historical archive. So I created, uh, I went to soundcloud.com and created a Vancouver WA 1972 tornado page and it's still there, you can see it. And I went to the museum and I found the yearbooks uh, for, the, for 1972 and I found pictures of all the kids that I interviewed and I included those pictures with the audio clips that I put on SoundCloud on the Vancouver WA 1972. So Brad could look at it, his team could look at it. And if there were interviews that were appropriate, I gave him the password, my login and password to my SoundCloud page. And you can download directly from SoundCloud. Uh, he, could, he could take whatever he, whatever he thought was most valuable and use it. I also just wanna share with you quickly, I have invested in my own equipment. Um, and this is my kind of my bag. It's kind of when I was in radio, I had the same thing. Um, and I did spend a little bit more. Uh, this Zoom, this is my Zoom recorder. Uh, and it does take those 128 um, um, uh, megabyte or terabyte, I guess it's a, it's a gigabyte, isn't it? Uh, which I have found to be helpful. I used some smaller uh, memory cards early on and I realized that they just stopped working when they were full. Um, and I thought I was gathering information, but they just stopped working. One of the other uh, really, really nice attributes of this is I spent an, another $50 to get a Bluetooth um, connection. Uh, and I can, my, my cell phone, I can put, I can, I can link my iPhone to that device with this Bluetooth. Uh, and I can interview, the, the Rick Grazier interview was conducted over the phone. Um, because of that Bluetooth connectivity. So that, that's been a really, really great tool. And anyway, those, we've covered a lot of territory. This has been a privilege to work on this. And I'm so happy that Brad and the museum have taken an interest in some of these interviews. Um, it really was an amazing event. And I'm, I'm really, really delighted that, that we got to remember Rick Grazier's mother and what she had done, that all the kids in her care were rescued. And with that, Brad, I'm gonna stop talking and hand it back to you. <laughs> And, and we'll get to questions in just a second, but Steve led perfectly into the answer to my question, what TV show most embodies museums? And he was talking about how he connected his phone and he, he recorded over the phone. And then again, Steve's interviews, when he brought them to us, you know, we reversed the process and said, hey, here's an oral history release. Can you go and have Thank these you, folks yes. sign the oral history? Okay, maybe it's an MP3. We can transfer that MP3 to a wave. And so for me, the TV show that most embodies museums is MacGyver uh, because we are always having to take the shoestring and the bubble gum and the paperclip and make stuff work. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's just that ingenuity and that willingness to be adaptable because we could very easily say to Steve, well, OK, it's not in wave and you don't have the form signed. I'm sorry, we can't use it. Walk away. We don't have time to deal with this. But we wouldn't know about Rick's mom. We wouldn't be able to save her story if we would have had that mentality. Instead, it's like, all right, Steve, let's let's figure out how to make this pencil now that we have these materials. And there's always a solution to those things. I think that's what you have to really work through. And um, I just I just want to thank and agree with that. And that's the attitude that you brought to this, Brad, all along has been flexibility and just go for it. And I did. Brad said, Steve, these are great. Uh, I'd love to keep them, but we need releases. So I, uh, I, found every, I found addresses for every one of those people that I'd interviewed. Every one of them agreed uh, to have their interviews included in the archive. And this is the envelope of, I mailed, I sent <laughs> self-addressed stamp envelopes to every person I interviewed with the release form. Had them, I put a tab on there, you sign here. Uh, they signed them and they mailed them back to me and then I delivered them to Brad. So it was an extra step that could have been avoided if I had a uh, planned ahead. Uh, but I was very excited about this and I wanted to get it done and I wanted to capture these interviews. And so, you know, Brad never once wagged his finger at me and said, well, if you were a serious historian, you know, he never <laughs> once did that. He was encouraging and said, great, now go get these releases done. All right, so Allison, I think we should probably open it up to, to some questions now. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll just quickly say thank you to you both so much. Um, I know I learned a lot. It was really powerful to hear those stories that you captured, Steve. Um, we've kind of been, uh, and April's been helping me kind of share information and answer questions as they came up, just sharing resources and things. Um, 
But if you have a question now that you'd like to throw out, or um, I should have prefaced this at the very beginning, if you haven't attended one of these programs before, I invited Brad and Steve um, to kind of speak because I know they're doing great work in this area, but they're certainly not the only ones who are doing good um, oral history work um, in, in their museum. So if you wanna share an experience you had, um, please just maybe raise your hand um, either literally or digitally and, and we can invite you to unmute and ask a question or share, share an experience. Anybody? Look at how thorough you two were. <laughs> yes, I think that's Sally, right? Oh, you're still muted there. Susie? Susie, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I, I just uh, kind of sent out an SOS to Brad the other day. I did my uh, 13th uh, audio uh, and um, I always was so scared of not having things go right that sometimes I would take two or three backups and I'd have my little baby laptop and I had a tablet and I had my phone and but I was relying on my phone basically and um, so I got it all set up before the guys got there for the interview and I clicked record to start and uh, to test it out and it goes oh no you're full can't use and so I panicked and I got my tablet out but um, I had three people that were in the interview. And so I had to back off in order to get everybody in the full picture. And therefore the microphone was quite a ways away. And uh, the gal, the main character I was interviewing, she had a very low kind of a muted voice. And so I sent the SOS out to Brad to see if, after the fact that he had uh, could wave his magic wand and enhance the voice. So he's uh, kind of made me relax and assured me that uh, he can help on that. So um, yeah, it, uh, it you always have to have your backups or fall back and punt and like Brad said, get the chewing gum out and the rubber bands or whatever it takes to duct tape to uh, sometimes make it work. But um, I think it uh, will be just fine. Yes. Um, Susie, we had a motto over the course of the pandemic with this kind of community of museums, be brave and try new things, right? And at some point you got to stop talking about it and just give it a try and you'll learn a lot and figure it out. And, um, and there's lots of people there to provide uh, help and support. So I'm delighted that it worked out in the end for you. I also think Brad correct that in Audacity, there's a pretty easy way to raise the sound levels and kind of adjust that. Um, I've been using Audacity for years. I used to use it with middle, middle school students and college kids and everybody figures it out real quick. It's very intuitive. So I was delighted to hear that that's what you all recommend as well. Um, but the audacity doesn't do videos, right? It does, does it? No, it doesn't. The video pad would be the thing that you could use and raise the levels. And that's a free program also. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. You'll need to get yeah. oh, Cindy. Yeah, but we had an experience at uh, Fall City Historical Society. We know that we've got to get some of these oral histories done. And we had a couple from our group give it a go to go to a gentleman's house and interview with him. Well, you know, it turns out, you know, his wife was home. And so, you know, as he's talking, you know, then she comes into the room, oh, she's got something to add to it. So I would say <laughs> really structure your environment <laughs> when you when you do your videos or your interviews also. Yeah, that's great. That's great advice. Yeah, as much as, much as you can control the space and what's happening in it. Um, yeah, Steve. If I can just add to that, that um, I, Brad has, has made the museum available to me. I mean, he said, if you want to come downstairs and use the research room, which is a nice controlled environment that's generally pretty quiet, um, because it is really hard when you've, especially if you've got kids or a dog or any, you know, those are all distractions that are going to, they're going to take away from your interview. So I go back to my museum uh, as kind of one of my, my first lines of when I need a quiet space, uh, they provided it. I haven't used that yet, but that's when I, when I've needed, I think it's where I'm going to turn. Yeah. And, and we've had a few people uh, actually even use my office because it's one of the only 
closed rooms in the entire building. Uh, so we have we have done that in the past with a few folks. Yeah, I could see using a, uh, a meeting room in in our local library to do uh, that, where you can shut the doors and you know. <laughs> partnerships yeah. with your local libraries can be so beneficial. So yeah. that's definitely yeah. something to really foster. We're we're kind of in the same club. It is such a, and it's so logical. It is so, I mean, one of the first, uh, I, I'm looking at Susie thinking another project that we've worked on together. And, you know, one of the very first, uh, uh, Brad and I were talking about the view story and, and the community of view, which is up north of battleground. And the first thing Brad did was take me to the library and said, let's go find the newspapers, you know, and see what we can find in view. And there is such, a, I think that's one of the, the messages or the experiences I've, I've taken away from this is that, the connection between the library and the museum is very, very close. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Um, well, uh, yes, how about, uh, I think Mike had something and then I noticed Dylan and Ben both turned their cameras on, so they might have something to say. So let's go Mike and Dylan and Ben. Yeah, I, I just would point out that uh, working with my tribe, I went out to the uh, State Archives in Tumwater and went through their microfilm set and once I was out there for a while, I had a sympathetic librarian that come out and, you know, help me. And he said, you know, this is what you're looking for, because if you haven't done the microfilm thing, I'm really good at scanning and I can scan a, re a reel of microfilm in maybe 10 hours. There's 100 reels in a drawer. That is, if you're doing nothing else all year long, that's a thousand hours right there. Well, the guy said, no, you're in the wrong drawer. Go over here. And we went through and we found it. And I, you can do this uh, deal to where you get a card and you fill it up with money and, and it, you print these pages of the, the microfilm. And so we, we printed pages of the uh, Indian Agent Treaty notes. And we found the Vancouver Treaty Council, which is really, really obscure because it didn't yield a treaty and so nobody cared. But we used that and our DC attorney was able to get these internal communications from one official to the other. And that became the, the basis for the restored lands ruling, which was the basis for our reservation case. And it was because we went out to the state library in Tumwater and a sympathetic person said, you're in the wrong drawer. You're, you know, literally, I would have been a thousand plus hours away from finding the right stuff, you know, and, and this is where I would give a shout out for the idea of the archives that uh, hopefully we can keep our archives because if you haven't been to archives, there is nothing cataloged there. It only is sort of, and you, you have to go down a lot of wrong alleys before you find out that no that's not the right direction go this way and you cannot do that in a day yeah. you know and so I, i'm just saying that that some of this stuff you have to hit it with an open mind and you have to know that a lot of you know that for me the library is that is the tool and, and it's right there so thank you yeah, of course. And it takes patience, doesn't it, Mike? Um, glad to hear you got such great service from our friends at the State Library and State Archives, right, Ben? Always happy to help. Um, Dylan, did you have something to share? Um, I kind of had a, a question. Um, uh, uh, you you talked about kind of a couple different um, models that you developed. You have the archivist in a backpack and you, um, you have your kind of own internal um, oral history guide and structure, and then, you know, a guide that you've shared with, you know, other organizations in the area. And I'm kind of curious about, um, you know, how much of those, each of those kind of um, maybe inform each other or, or, or kind of how you came about to kind of develop all, all of these different plans, right? Was it that you had your internal kind of oral history projects that you were really focused on, and then you saw a need, and so you developed the archivist in a backpack? Um, or was it kind of all part of one big project to, for your, for, you know, Clark County Historicals Oral Histories? I, I think I would say on my part of the, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to credit my staff with the other part of it. My part of it was a, was engagement with constant failure. 
uh, in the sense that we felt like we weren't capturing, like I referred back to that Bill Hidden story, and that we had the process, because um, Susan Tissot, who used to be the director here, taught an oral history class, and that was the model that she had set for the museum, which was the, the full-on, you know, big, hulky, bulky oral history that you would do, that you had to do all the research and all the pieces, and it's 120 to 200 hours per subject, and that was the line that I held for many, many years. And, and what happened is, is I talked with our team and our staff, they're meeting with people, they're connecting with people, they're out engaging with the community um, in the sense of our history work. And they're saying, you know, there's people out here with stories, like how can we make this more accessible? And finally, you know, through that collaboration and conversation with our team and really coming from the team um, was saying, well, let's differentiate. Let's say we have an oral history. We can do that if we need to. And we have an interview. Now, how do we provide um, process through the continuum? And that's when we started thinking about it more in that spectrum model, as opposed to one or the other. And that's where uh, you know, April, our outreach and programs manager went and found the archivist in a backpack model that someone else was doing. Also, again, even us bigger guys, <laughs> I use the quotes, uh, look at the big institutions and say, what are they using and how can we adapt these for um, more accessible models? How can we change these to make it where we're at least capturing some stories? And so it really was through realizing that we were creating a artificial barrier um that was unnecessary and and it wasn't helpful to the community saying well you know we're the only professionals that can do oral histories that wasn't beneficial to anyone opening it up and saying you can do something on this spectrum from oral history to interview here's the tools if you want them like if someone wants to come in and learn how to do an oral history sure we'll we'll sit down and work through that with them but if they're like i just want to go out and interview people and and have conversations we're going to be open to that also and then reverse engineer um those as we go so it was really a, a collaborative years and almost over a decade long process of just trial and error and failure. And then eventually as a director, really taking the lead from my staff who is doing the work every day and, and saying, yes, go for it, do this, make it happen. Um, because they're the ones that are really doing that. And I think that's the best thing you can do as a director is just get the heck out of your staff's way and just support them and invest in what they see, the tools that they need. Awesome, Thank thanks. Brad. So I wanted to jump in a little bit. So if I can, um, so I'm April, I'm the, actually the outreach manager and kind of overseeing um, Archives of the Backpack. And I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how, from the staff perspective, how that developed. And um, really the impetus for us was, for me, for trying to get something like this together was when we hit the pandemic as I'm talking to our community um, uh, partners, uh, particularly the indigenous community and the veteran community, um, we were running into a problem where for various reasons, cultural or um, health reasons, we weren't able to get out there to, to collect these interviews and, or these histories. Um, in particular, it, even outside the pandemic, like some of these communities don't trust us as an organization and they have every right to not trust us. Um, and so what I wanted to do is try and create a, a program which fits into the overall museum's concept of agency and facilitation where I can train the story keepers for those communities. So I, or where the museum can give the information and the tools to someone who is the storykeeper and spiritual leader for the Cowlitz or for the Chinook, or who is the historian for the NAACP and the Black Lives Matters group, because that's not my story to be collecting and that's not my story to tell. Um, and so I started, I had been lucky when I was in my, um, uh, my graduate program where I was introduced to Archivist in a Backpack. Archivist in a Backpack was designed originally by the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill under a Mellon, Mellon Foundation grant. Um, and theirs is a huge one. It's a program that's designed, their backpacks go all over the world and are in, in communities in um, the Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, that's more than we really need here or can do. 
um, how do I tailor it for our local communities? How do I bring it to smaller? And, and how do I start small and grow it? So right now, the program is very specifically around collecting oral interviews, but there's actually a plan to expand it more to how do you do um, archiving of documents and such. And so the idea is that quarterly I go out, I get a, I open a workshop up to a group of people, and then I show them how to use the equipment, how do you do, do the interviews, and then send them off and be like, okay, check it in, bring it back. Um, and then, and so a lot of the conversation since then has been about this, okay, how do we integrate it to what we already have? Because we have these established rules on how things are archived. So how do we build this program so that it works aligned with that program. And I hope yeah. that makes sense. And I didn't yeah, babble too much. <laughs> and also, I think that we have to, again, go back to that consideration Oops. of, you know, what is our role as a museum or history institution? Is it to just vacuum up everything and keep it to ourselves? Or is our actual end goal that it is saved? It Meaning, is it saved within the community and kept there where there's trust and they have agency, or do we always have to have it for it to be truly preserved and saved? And I think that's a conversation that we need to have, um, especially again with indigenous communities, communities, you know, BIPOC communities that maybe have less trust. Um, just helping those things be saved and kept by community, I think is just as valuable as us vacuuming stuff up into our archives. Thanks, Brad. And Emily. I mean, April, sorry, Emily. I'm not doing great with names today, am I? Um, ben, did you have anything or were you just saying hello? Oh, I, I was just going to say hello. However, I will say that since we've had staff working on an oral history project that was done in the mid 70s on audio cassette tapes that uh, we've now digitized, but they had been degraded pretty well. It's something to keep in mind and, and just for everyone to remember, you're going to have to, or you and your future staffs will have to migrate those MP3s because there probably won't be MP3 players in 50 years or probably 20 years. But uh, just be mindful that the uh, the format will change, and and you don't want to have pull out a flash drive in 30 years and, and wonder what it is and not be able to play it. So back in the 70s, the transcript was the was the end result generally. However, we get so much more out of an oral history when you can actually hear the voice. So we're very pleased that we can cobble these uh, collections together. But just uh, I would encourage you to think to the future as well and uh, make sure that you have a format that will endure. So, but I just was thinking of that, but thank you again for, uh, for this uh, uh, talk today. Yeah, thanks for that reminder, Ben, for sure. I mean, my poor mom has been trying to digitize my dance recitals from the 80s for like that. Anybody needs to see that. Oh, my gosh. Um, question, <laughs> smart Alec. Um, question from Jean about transcriptions. Um, yeah, so there were a couple questions earlier about this as well. Um, and the, 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 tr the process for transcribing interviews can be so onerous. We here at the State Historical Society just use an online service called Trint, and I shared the link. I can share it again in the email. It's an it's a artificial intelligence type thing. So you just basically upload your audio and it's going to come back to you. You pay per page. It's pretty reasonably priced very reasonably priced actually, but there's gonna be a lot of mistakes. So you're gonna to need to give it another good listen and, and edit it carefully. Um, April uh, shared um, a different uh, tool that you use and then you usually have volunteers helping with that as well yep. um, with those transcriptions. Yeah, express um, right. Yeah, anybody else have any hot tips around transcribing these things? I don't have any um, hot tips, but uh... I worked for the Hershey Community Archives as a volunteer for a while, and we did work on oral histories. What uh, I didn't do any of the oral histories, but I was a um, brought in to review the paper copies versus the oral uh, okay. copy. And of course, they were on cassette tapes back when I did that. But I just looked at their archive uh, website while I was uh, listening to you guys. 
And uh, they have a wonderful website now with 582 oral histories on it. Um, uh, I don't know what they're doing for format, but uh, listening to all of your suggestions really made me aware of the resource I have locally here in Hershey, Pennsylvania uh, for uh, going to them and asking what their process was and how they got to this point of having this many oral histories um, on their website. So they uh, did everybody from people who worked in the uh, chocolate factory to people who drove the trolleys, uh, you know, gathered the milk cans, that sort of thing. It was just a wonderful experience just for me listening to it. And I have to say thank you, thank you, thank you, because as a volunteer, uh, listening to you all and uh, the resources that you offered has just been invaluable to me. Thank you. Jacqueline, where did you find out about our session today? Well, I'm from the West Coast originally, and I belong to an organization, a historical organization out there, and I got the email that uh, you were going to be offering these, and so I, of course, signed up right away. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we're so glad you could join us from Pennsylvania. The first Upside Down Roller Coaster I ever went on was at Hershey Park, and it has set me up for a lifetime of loving roller coasters. So very fond of Hershey. Um, okay, things are being shared in the chat. Ben has shared, Brad shared. What is that? That's the recorder. Oh, okay, uh, that's the link USB to the, transfer. Yeah, gotcha, yeah. I hate those Amazon links are always so they are terrible. <laughs> ginormous. Yep, and then Ben shared this project. Ben, really quickly, um, question from Jean. What was the process or what piece of equipment or how do you literally transfer the old tape to a digital file? Good question. I don't know. There, the it's it's been a little about a couple of years since we put that up. I'd have to, I'll have to come back and figure out what that if in the notes field. I don't know if it includes. Uh, doesn't get that technical. Uh, I'll have to see what what we did. If, um, if you discover like the name of the piece of equipment or whatever and can pass it on, that'd be awesome. Yeah, we've got an oral pro, uh, or no, not an oral history, but a the uh, House and Senate uh, committee tapes, thrilling as they are, but important records for us. Uh, so they're working right now. So I'll just follow back up with the, uh, the hardware that they're using and software as well. Yeah. Awesome. So Allison, yeah. we used Audacity and we used this recorder right here, which is I think the one I pasted into the link from Amazon to digitize okay. our cassette tapes uh, for our oral histories. Gotcha. For the, to digitize your older. Yeah. We had a bunch of two, like yeah. 200 cassette tapes and then we digitized them. And all it is, is it's just a USB. It's just a cassette player with a USB plug. You plug it in the computer and then you pull audacity up and you just transfer it straight over. It's like magic. It's yeah. That's what we did. I mean, we worked with the WCU archive and that was what Robert over there ended up having us do. And you know, obviously there was level adjusting and all those things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good to know that there are pretty and, accessible resources out there. And I imagine that's going to be perfect for that scale. I think we're dealing with thousands of cassettes. So yeah, I think yeah. we have a pretty hardcore uh, uh, form. Uh, uh, we've got three staff working on it around the clock. Yeah. So And well, a bigger budget yeah. and all those things. <laughs> and yeah. there's also services you can send it out to. We just use GT recording in Tacoma to digitize um, some reel-to-reel -reel tapes that we couldn't digitize on our own. So there's also services you can enlist. Yeah, awesome. Here, I'm gonna share GT recording here in the chat. Look at me with all these links. I will share the, um, the chat uh, in my follow-up email as well, since we've shared so much information in here um, so that you should have access to all those links and things. Um, it is 11.30. I think that was a wonderful, hour and a half spent with you all. And I'm so grateful to Brad and Steve for sharing their know-how and everything that they've kind of learned in doing this. Um, I just really wanna emphasize um, the, the point they both made that, um, you know, there are stories missing from our collections because the stuff wasn't deemed important enough to, to save 
um, throughout the years. And oral history is such a powerful tool for correcting that erasure in our collections. Um, and uh, Steve and I were talking earlier about how um, important it is to be out there collecting stories of COVID, right? Because in a hundred years, we're all gonna be doing that anniversary exhibit right and or not us but our future selves right and we want to make sure they have really inclusive diverse materials to draw on when they're doing those exhibits that that important stories aren't left out and it's really up to us it's our job um to to build that uh collection now so thanks for um being here brad and steve thank you so much i think that was some really really useful information expect an email from me probably definitely by the end of the week um with the powerpoint and the recording and the chat and all of these things that you can um, share and use and refer back to um, but otherwise if it's still snowing where you are it's still snowing here in tacoma um uh stay safe and stay warm and um we'll be in touch take care everyone